Okay. Let's take our Bible this morning if you have one. And I want you to go to 1 Peter in chapter 3. 1 Peter in chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 this morning. <clears throat> I've been... <laughs> I don't have to tell you this, but I'll tell you anyway. But uh, I've been giving you some reruns lately, and I hope that you who pay attention uh, will give me grace. And uh, you who don't pay attention, you wouldn't even know that it was a rerun. I'm not looking up right now. And you who've never been here, you just it's, it's just like a world premiere video. And how many remember? <laughs> oh, gosh, sorry. I'm an, I, I grew up on MTV. I grew up on MTV, doodle doodle dee, wubba wubba wubba, and uh, I remember that. Well, that didn't, that wasn't any music. That was just the saying. All right, so I don't want to put any other. I won't go any further than that. Downtown Martha Jones, you know, all that sort of, sort of stuff. And Martha, what was her name? Anyway, thank you. I <laughs> got it. I did, that's what I grew up on, and you know, you I honestly. I remember uh, Metallica had never put out a video before. They were they were they were they were above that. They were too, uh, you know, their music was too relevant for that. But this came into play, right? As it always does, and so finally they came out with their first video, and uh, I think it, I think it was one. And man, I'm telling you, man, I, I sat on the edge of my seat waiting for the first Metallica video to be on. And then it came on. And it was over. I'm just saying, that's sometimes the world premiere videos, that's how it goes. I hope that you just sit on the edge of your seat now if you're waiting for a world premiere <laughs> message. But then it's not just over when it's over. That's the thing about the Word of God. By the way, nothing of this, none of this is in my notes. This, I'm just ad-libbing right now. Uh, the Word of God, it just keeps going, doesn't it? It keeps speaking. I was, I was pondering that this morning for various reasons and just how uh, it, it, it doesn't stop. And it's not supposed to stop. And uh, God gave you a will. You're going to do with it what you want to do with it. Uh, and you can eventually say, I don't want to hear it anymore. Yeah. And God will, God will stop it. Sure. God, will, God will shut it. You don't ever want that. No. You always want it to be, even when you don't want it. Right. You want it to be. That's, 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 that's part of the, well, what the Bible would describe as the prick of the heart. Mm-hmm. When, when Paul, who was before saved, called, was called Saul, um, the Lord stopped him when he saved him and said, uh, Saul, Saul, it's hard for thee to kick against the what? The pricks. So what were those pricks? Well, it was, it was the cries, no doubt, of children and mothers and fathers as he would haul men and women off to be persecuted for following the way called Christ. It was certainly... And probably one of the last, the cry of Stephen. And, I mean, what a prick. Say, what was the cry of Stephen? Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Whoa. I mean, we're going to stone this guy? We're going to kill this guy for the faith? And he's just looking up toward heaven and going, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Oh, God, help us. I mean, God help us to have that faith, right? Those are the pricks of the Word of God. It's hard for you to kick against it. Make it always hard to kick against the pricks of the Word of God. First Peter chapter 3, that's where I want you to be this morning for really just one verse. And I, I, I want to, as I try to do always, but in particular Sunday mornings, uh, to lift up Jesus Christ. And... Uh, I want him to be glorified, and, and I want him to have the preeminence. As if, if you're reading the bulletin, I'll say, I pray for the preeminence, that he have the preeminence in all things. In other words, he'd be, he'd be ruling in all things in our heart, in our life, in our church, our families, our governments. 
And uh, I want Christ to have the preeminence. And the Bible says here, in, in he's speaking of persecution, but then he gets down to verse 18, and he still is speaking about persecution. And we won't speak about that as much, but I want you to look at this verse 18. And I think it's a gospel in a, in a, to a degree, in a nutshell. The gospel is that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. And, and, but it help, helps here as we see another, not another portion of it, but a, but a view of it. And he says in verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, notice now, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. I want to read that again, just maybe with a little commentary. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. That's the death on the cross. See, see, because Christ suffered in the hands of sinners more than once. More than once. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, many times they tried to, they tried to take him. But it wasn't his time yet. So he... In, in, a, in a godly way, he, he just he disappeared. I mean, I don't know how it worked, but it's going to be neat to see the commentary on that someday. As we, you know, we, we, because we live in this visual generation, you understand that they didn't say this in 1800? We would say what? Well, someday we'll be able to turn to the screen in heaven. You know, here we go. We just, and I'll be making the popcorn because I make the best popcorn. And, and so I will be... Amen. And, uh, and we just sit there, right? And I don't know if we all have our own little room or there's just a bunch of theaters, you know. And well, what's playing today? Noah. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> right? Or this one, again. Like we're, so, so they're going to take Jesus Christ and then he just was gone. Whoa, rew- rewind that. And then they just say, no, you've got to come back for the matinee. You know, just right? Okay, that's me. You, you don't have to have that view of heaven. I do. Praise the Lord. I'm going to be there, and I look forward to those type of things. But, but he, just, he just would go. So he was suffering more than once, but, but ultimately, for sinners, he died on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And so, again, verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just, that's Jesus. He is the just. For the unjust, that's every man. That's every man who's ever walked the earth. Every, every, every man, every woman, every child. That's every person who's ever walked the earth, the ju- unjust. That then, notice, look, look, look at the reason. And I love this. And if you mark your Bible, and I think it's okay to mark your Bible, you ought to have the right pens that I sell. And uh, <laughs> you know, my popcorn, my pens, no. But just, I say that so they don't bleed through, so you don't ruin the other side of the page. And you, but, but if you did, you, you would maybe want to circle that. And when you read your Bible, that is an important word. Now, they're all important, right? But that gives you the purpose so many times. I mean, that gives you the context. So that, why do you do all that? That he, that's the just, that's Jesus, who is called Christ, might bring, notice, us. That's the unjust. That's every man, every woman, every child to God. Man, right there. Isn't that awesome? That he might bring us to God. The Bible says there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. One mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Uh, The Bible says that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says that Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me. There's a broad way that leads to a destruction. There's a narrow way that leads to life. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. The just. He might bring us to God. Now notice how He did that, being put to death in the flesh. But quickened. By the Spirit, speaking of His resurrection. I'm just saying that Jesus Christ, He came, the Bible says there, that He might bring us to God. I I mean, all throughout the Scriptures, the Bible speaks of this act, this work, this work of salvation, this work of grace. The Bible says in John that the Word became flesh 
and dwelt among us. Whew. What's that mean? The word, not this word, but the word, capital W, in the book of John, you'll see it, John 1, uh, John 1, 14, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was with, uh, the word was with God, the word was God. That's Jesus, capital W. That, that was his name in heaven. And, uh, and it will be his name, I believe, again. And that word became flesh. So I don't get that. You're, you're, you're in good company. The Bible says, great is the mystery of godliness. God is manifest in the flesh. I, I don't understand that. You, you don't have to understand it. You just got to believe it. You don't have to understand it. But there's a lot of things in this book right here that I do not understand. I mean, just this week I'm reading again, I'm reading uh, uh, the land grants to Israel as they came into promised land. You went over Jordan, came into Jericho, the walls fell flat, then moved on and moved on and moved on. And now they're getting their land. And, and man, God spends more time telling us about that land grant than he does about Genesis 1. You know, and you, you've heard me say it before, you that have been here. I mean, I'll trade a couple of those chapters for more information on the creation. But God didn't do it that way, right? But what I'm saying is, I don't understand why God did that, but I don't have to understand why God did that. I just got to believe it. I just got to work on that and act on that. And so I don't understand everything. It's a great mystery, the mystery of godliness. But I know this, God was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. He was seen of angels and so on and so forth. And so look, look, I'm just saying this, that he came down. And that was Jesus Christ's life. Christ's life was a life of humility. We read a couple weeks ago, Matthew chapter number 11, and we spoke about 28 and 29, and come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest, hallelujah. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Why? For I am meek and lowly in spirit, and you shall find rest for your souls. Lowly, lowly. Say, what's, what's so amazing about that? He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. Did he, by him, all things consist. He spoke the word and we are here. That, that's the one who became lowly. By, by, by the way, lowly doesn't mean homely. Say, why do you say that? I don't know, sometimes people get this idea that if you're lowly, you have to kind of, I mean, you have to, with, you know. I mean, I don't, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I don't, you, you can't, you can't comb your hair, you can't brush your teeth, you can't clean your sandals, you can't wash your robe. I mean, it just, lowly doesn't mean homely. Lowly means lowly. Homely means homely. But maybe you don't have that perception, but a lot of people do. It's lowly. He's, he's, he, the, lowly indicates humility. Lo, lowly indicates no reputation. The Bible says about him that he made himself of no reputation. He's, he's, he's lo, lowly indicates an absence of pride, a denial of self lowly that, that's jesus christ's life lowly jesus christ's life was one that was an example of lowliness an example you see one reason that jesus christ came to this earth one reason not not the only reason but one reason that jesus christ came to this earth earth was to leave us an example that we should walk in his steps Example. See, see, far too many times we look at salvation and Christ's life as an escape, and it is. It's an escape. Like, like, like I, I haven't watched a debate on TV. I mean, I've seen some in my house. I've observed a few in the church. Not with you, other churches, other churches that I go to. 
not heritage. <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you know this, but we have a camera system here at church, and it's got two cameras out here and two in the nursery, and I can pull that up on my phone at any time. So I've seen some in the nursery. Debates. Your child, not my child anymore, but your child hitting another child who bites that child in return, and they're not only debaters, but they're malicious and backbiters and all. I've observed those things, but not, not, not I've seen those things. I've seen them. Um, um, I know there's an election coming up. Does anybody know that? Isn't that crazy? It's like 10 days away or something like that. Ray knows the hours and minutes, but I just know the sim- you know, area, that sort of thing. I say that because some of you are so uptight about what's going to happen on, on, on next Tuesday that, that you're, you're missing the point. Yeah. And see, not only have I has escaped the condemnation of hell because of Jesus Christ, but, but I, have, I have escaped. I have escaped. Yeah. What? I've escaped. Amen. I'm here. Yeah. I'm in the world. I'm not of the world, but I'm in the world. Right. But I, I've escaped. Yep. You see, are you just in blissful ignorance? Oh, no, 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 no. Contrary. I understand that there's issues and problems. And so, but, I, but I've escaped those things through Jesus. I know that the ants. Look, I'm going to vote on next Tuesday. I'm going to vote. I'm going to, I'm going to vote for the candidate who is not for killing unborn babies. Okay. Say why? Because I'm going to vote according to the scriptures. Now, I am going to vote for the candidates. They can be Republican or Democrat. Now, we, we know where most people go on these sides of the line, but it's an issue. It's not a party. I am going to vote for the candidate who is for the Bible on marriage. And when we're talking about presidential, we understand that it's more about the presidency. We also have this branch of government that is judicial. Who will be appointing people in that area, correct? So this, this, is, this is just sidebar right now. So I'm going to vote for what I think is going to give us those. Say, what about, I'm talking about Bible things. You can vote all your other little things and read your little things and worry about this thing and that thing and this thing. But what does the Bible say? What saith the Scripture? What's that got to do with me? I've escaped those things. I'm living here. And I hate to see the country going in this direction and that direction instead of the direction of Jesus Christ. But I've escaped those things. Jesus Christ is our escape. Not that we live in blissful ignorance, but, listen, I, I don't have to be a, alarmed at those things. In fact, the Bible tells me all this stuff is going to happen. Huh? It's not like it's a three-alarm Fire. Well, maybe it is, but I knew it was coming. And if it is a three-alarm fire, it's just a kindling for that day when God is going to melt it all with a fervent heat. So, So I've escaped that. But Christ is not just an escape. I think too many Christians just look at Jesus Christ as an escape. Too many saved people. You just look at Jesus as an escape hatch. But, but he's way more than that. He's our example. And, and one of the ways he's an example to us is in lowliness. In humility. In denial of self. Denial of self. And Jesus Christ exemplified this From the moment he left heaven's glory heaven's fellowship now look guys it probably doesn't happen as much with us okay 
just, it, and every family's different, and there's nothing wrong with it being different. But, but when, 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 when men leave the home, and they should leave the home someday, I thought I'd get at least one more amen. I mean, one more amen than none. Say, I'm not married yet. Well, you could, you could do the leaving part first, and then you'll get some cleaving later on, okay? Some of you, that'll catch on here in a while. <laughs> when men leave home, it's more of a relief many times than it is. <sighs> Christ's leaving home was something else. And it has no, it, look, look, it doesn't make, it, by, by no means does it make him less. And you're talking about for eternity. He's been with the Father. And for eternity, say, so how long has that been? Well, it's eternal, right? For, for eternity, it's, it's been this, all right? Let's, let's, let's go back 2,000 years. And for eternity, up to that point, it was. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power and blessing. And that's what it's been for eternity. And then when that chorus start, stopped, it started again. And 2,000 years ago, Christ made a decision based upon the Father's will. I'm going down. I'm going down. And he left that. Say, why? Because if you're going to bring someone somewhere, you still in 1 Peter 3? Look at it. Look at it, 1 Peter 3. That he might bring us to God. You see that? If you're going to bring someone, you've got to go get them. You've got to go get them. Well, he's not here right now. Well, he came. And he came down. So, If you're going to bring someone to Christ, you say, well, there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We've said it here a thousand times if we've said it once. Look, there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, but there's many mediators between men and Christ. And I'm looking at them. You, You have been given, you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, what is reconciliation? Bringing two parties that are at odds with one another together. That's reconciliation. Bringing two parties that are at odds with one another together. That's what Christ does. We were enemies, and now we're friends because of Jesus Christ. The, 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 the middle wall of partition was broken down, and he makes of twain one. And we're in the ministry of reconciliation. People that don't know that they're at odds with God are told that they're at odds with God because of sin. But you don't have to be at odds with God. And by the way, if you're at odds with God, He's right and you're wrong. If you're at odds with God, He's right and you're wrong. So we come, we're in the ministry of reconciliation, and and in this society today, you may not have had to do this 50 years ago, but we're not 50 years ago. We're in 2016. Hello. Welcome. Do you know you're a sinner? What's sin? What's sin? Are we going to start there today? No, we're not going to start there today because we're not talking about that right now, but we have to tell people why, so they can know that they're at odds with God because sin is at odds with God. All sin is against God. It opposes God. And you have to find out that you're wrong before you can be right. So that's the ministry of reconciliation, part of that, so that you can bring people to Jesus Christ who then can bring us to who? God. To God. And so Jesus Christ's life was one of lowliness, one of humility, one of, if you would, submission. And Jesus Christ, it was down, 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 down. I mean, 
Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, just so we can kind of, you know, flip a little bit here, see what a Bible, the Bible says. Not just quote it, but see it. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. This is a great missions chapter. And I, in fact, I don't think this week that anyone even turned, that I was at the meeting, I was at, everyone turned to there. But usually when we're talking about missions, we go here, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10 is a treatise by Paul to the church at Corinth on giving. And Christ sets the example. Christ sets the example. He sets the example, the good example, in everything. And the Bible says here in 2 Corinthians 8, and if you would look at verse number 9, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Say, what did he do? He left all the riches of heaven to come down to earth. Again, we might look at earth and go, man, it's pretty nice. And it is pretty nice, especially where we live. I mean, all week long I've been hearing, uh, well, you know, where, where are you guys at? And then you say Post Falls, and they, they have no idea where Post Falls is. So then you say Coeur d'Alene. <gasps> Coeur d'Alene. And I just tell them, that's our ugly stepsister over there. And, uh, but just, uh, just Coeur d'Alene. And then they go, oh, 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 I drove through there once. That place is gorgeous. You know why they say that? Because it is. It's beautiful, right? I mean, that's why some of you moved here. You came over there, Timothy Lane over there on I-90, and you got that view of the lake on the south side there, and it's that just picture, postcard effect, and went, oh, sweetie, we've got to move here. And you found out the houses weren't as cheap as you thought they were, and the wages are certainly not as high as you thought they were. But you know what? It's beautiful. So we put up with that sort of stuff. And yet, it's tainted by sin. Heaven is not. Heaven is not. And Christ left that. He left those riches, and he became poor. I mean, like real poor. Not, li- not like just saying we're poor, but we have a shelf full, and a garage full, and a shed full and a cellar full, and a storage, you know, place full, and, but poor. Like, so poor that he's born where the animals are. And God did all that on purpose. There was no room in the inn on purpose. I, I think. You know, are we talking about, we're talking about Christmas right now. There's no room. And he came down. He came down from heaven. Look over to John chapter 3. Look over to John chapter 3. We just need to move on here a little bit here. And let's get through this thing and not get through it, but show you Amen. and make the point. The point is this. I'll tell you what the point is. The point is if you're going to help people to God, you got you to gotta go down. Amen. You gotta, we would say, someone would say, come down from your high horse. You've got to get down from your lofty position. Well, I, well, And I don't know where your lofty position is or if you're in a lofty position, but I just know man, man gets in a lofty position pretty quick over pretty petty things. And in a selfie society, gets there r- really quick. I did and me did and all that stuff, right? And uh, you've got to come down. You got, you got to come down. If you're going to bring people to Christ, who is going to bring them to God, you know what that is? That's, that's, the, that's the escape. Yeah. That's the escape. And by the way, the escape is good. Amen. I don't want to minimize the escape, but there's more than the escape. Hallelujah. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, look at verse number 13. John chapter 3 and verse number 13, the Bible says here, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So he ascended up to heaven. We see that. But first, the Bible says there in verse 13, that he had to come down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. He's gone back up. He sits at the right hand of the throne of God the Father. But first he came down from heaven. No one leaves heaven once they get there. No one wants to leave heaven 
once they get there. The only other example we have of this, I think, if I remember, recall, is the Apostle Paul who was stoned at one place and, uh, and revived, but it appears that he got caught up to the third heaven. His soul got caught up to the third heaven. His body was still laying there, and the disciples are looking at him. I'm probably weeping. What are we going to do? This is the apostle to the Gentiles. And all of a sudden, right? There was a little shake in there going on. He's awake. Praise the Lord. But, but at that time, and by the way, see, see, how could that happen? Well, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. See, see, when someone expires, expires, that's their breath goes out, their spirit is gone. At that moment, they are either in an eternal place of torments called hell, or they are with the Lord. And outside of Paul, forever. Forever. But Paul got up to the third heaven. He says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I can't tell. Such one caught up to the third heaven and he heard things that were amazing. But he couldn't speak them to people at that time. John gets to speak them later on in the book of Revelation. And I'm just saying this, when you get to heaven, you don't want to leave heaven, but Jesus Christ came down from heaven. Look at John chapter 6, just a couple, couple, couple page is over you don't want to leave you don't want to leave I got to tell you as I'm, as I'm preaching this I'm thinking because I try to think while I'm preaching it's very helpful there may be an exception to that I say what do you mean well, the Bible says that with rich man and Lazarus, there was a great gulf fixed between hell and that place called paradise. So that not only the people in hell couldn't get over to paradise, but the people in paradise couldn't get over to hell. So how does that all work? I don't know. I just read it at one time. What would they, what would they want to do leaving paradise to get people out of hell? That's what I'll do. Why don't you do it now? Amen. Why don't you do it now? Yep. Now is when you can. Yep. You can't later. But you can now. But you're going to have to come down. Preach. Well, I thought, get down from that thought. Yep. Well, come down. John 6, look at verse 38. For I came down from heaven. John 6.30. I came down from heaven, Christ says. Not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. That's pretty important, but we won't park there. Look at verse 41. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. That's what he was. Verse 51. The Bible says there, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Look at verse number 58. This is that bread which came down from heaven, speaking of himself, not as your fathers that eat manna and are dead, he that eateth of this bread shall live be forever. You see, what is this? This is the word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. He left, left the riches of heaven for the poverty of this earth. Why? That he might bring us to God. And if you're going to bring someone to Christ, bring someone to God, you're going to come down. Come down, Jesus Christ did from heaven. Not only that, he just, he just, his life was a life, again, of lowliness. His life was a life of humility. Look over to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. This is his life. Not, not calling the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And if you're going to call sinners to repent, you've got to go to them. How shall they hear? We're going to cover that on Wednesday night. How shall they hear without a preacher? You know what I find myself doing? I find myself picking and choosing who I want to witness to. Why? Well, because I think they would make a better convert than they would make a better convert. You know what that is? Wrong. Let's just call it. It's sin. So are you confessing? I guess, but I don't have to confess it to you. I'm just telling it to you. I want you to know this, that look, I got flesh just like you got flesh, and I don't live above you. I deal with the same issues. What? I just, you get on a high horse. 
Say, what's a high horse? Well, well, look, look, a high horse can be a Shetland pony if you're on it. I go back here so you can't see me. Right? Do you understand Christ rode a horse one day? Yeah, right up to the cross. Right up to the, well, the place where he's going to die. Well, it was a colt, the foal of an ass. Do you understand he's going to ride a high horse someday? And by the way, do you understand that if I got the Bible right, you that are saved are going to ride a high horse someday? According to Revelation, what is it, 19? He's coming back on a white horse, and it looks like the armies that are in heaven, they follow him. Well, the only way you're going to keep up with a horse is if you're on a horse as well. Especially if it's coming from heaven. Help. Amen. But in the meantime, stay off the high horse. Where did I say John 8? Look at verse number 6. And the Bible says here, there's a woman here who's taken in adultery, caught in the very act, the Bible says. And the Bible says in verse 6, this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus, notice, stooped down with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. You see that? Look at verse 8. And again, he stooped down. And he wrote on the ground. Say, what are you saying? I'm just saying life, Jesus Christ's life was one of humility. It was one of lowliness. It was one of submission. It was, it, it was one of going down to help people. Well, well, if you came to help me, does that mean you had to go down? Well, yeah. Well, what do you think? You are higher than me? No, but you were in a low place. Just receive it. And thank God for the person who got there and he got down and he took some dirt and he got down on his hands and knees and he just... <sighs> I've touched sinners and I've touched dirt. <laughs> You're going to have to do that to help sinners. You're going to have to do that to help dirty people. I always appreciated the girls on our bus routes in college, the girls in particular, the, the ones who labored in our bus routes. When we were, I was at Oklahoma Baptist College and got on the bus routes, and lice would go through the public school systems nearly every year, and uh, especially in the areas we were. And our, our girls, you know, on those bus routes, the guys didn't have to worry about it as much. We had the military haircut going on or else. <laughs> but every year, see, see, if you're going to help sinners, you've got to handle sinners. You're going to have to get down. And I remember going into the, and they get lice every year. All the girls in the dorm had to wash all their sheets. And, you know, it was the first time they'd ever done it, but I just had to wash all their sheets. <laughs> had to learn somehow, right? I'm, just, I'm, I'm joking. And, they're, you know, they have to use that special shampoo and special uh, comb, and it's just not fun, right? Even just talking about it, you start kind of going. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we had, a, we had a gal here a while back ago, and, her little girl's got it. You remember her, Alicia? And, you know, she's, you know, you should pray for her. I don't know where she's at. We don't know where she's at. But, man, those little girls were precious, weren't they? And they had lice. And I remember coming up to them, and I remember just giving them a hug. And I just said, Lord, help me not to get lice. But, I, but, it, but you had to handle them. You got to handle them. Say, why? Because you love them. You know what Christ did? He, he loved he loved sinners. He came to call sinners. If you're going to help them and bring them to God, you're going to have to get down in some... You're going to have to become the dirt. 
You don't have to become the dirt. You don't have to taste the dirt. So that's foolish. You getting it? You don't have to eat the dirt. Well, how am I going to win? Am I... But you've got to go to the dirt. You've got to get down sometimes. In the dirt. That's what Jesus Christ, he stooped. This is, you, you don't understand, this is, this is the Son of God. This is God manifest in the flesh. He got down. And the scribes and the Pharisees, here even, trying to accuse him. Because why? Well, man, they were the whited sepulchers. God forbid that even a portion of dirt would be on their garments. Remember one time Christ walked through the cornfields and then the disciples, they said to him, man, your disciples eat with unwashing hands. If you don't think that was intentional, let me tell you, it was intentional. I mean, Christ knew exactly what they're thinking. I think they walked through there and I mean, they just grabbed the corn and ripped it off and went, oh, you don't know what bacteria is in that. It's not like Jesus Christ had the hand sanitizer on his belt. I'm not saying that if you can't wash your hands, you don't wash your hands. I'm just saying you got to get down. Look at Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. you got to go down. Jesus Christ is our humble Savior. He's meek and lowly. He gets down so that he can bring us to God. As an escape, yes, but as an example that you should follow his steps. You've heard me say before that the Son of God became the Son of Man, that the sons of man can become the sons of God. This is exactly what he's showing us here in example. The Bible says here in Luke chapter number 22, look at verse number 41, and the Bible says here, you there? And he was withdrawn from them, but his disciples, Peter, James, and John, about a stone's cast, and he kneeled down and prayed. Down. It's his life. He's it's just down, down, down. It's just, so what does he do? He kneels down. This is a prayer position. It's not the only prayer position. You don't have to kneel down to pray, but you can kneel down and pray. I think you should kneel down and pray sometimes. I think you ought to put both knees on the ground. Just, this is just, this is have monology. Why? Just, this is just, this is a very vulnerable position. And it's made to be a vulnerable position. Why? Because you're defenseless. But you're defending. And you're defenseless. And God is defending. If you read Ephesians chapter number 6, where the Christian puts on the whole armor of God that he may be able to withstand in the evil day. And brethren, we are in an evil day. And I think it peaks at times like this. Halloween. Say, what's wrong with it? Just... Just be honest. Just be honest to say what's wrong with it. When has witchcraft ever been proper? When has Satanism ever been proper? When is dressing up like a devil cute? Just be honest. I like the candy. Well, eat the candy, but be honest. Right? And, 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 and you want to talk about evil peaking, forget about Halloween. Talk about that second Tuesday in November. You, you don't think that there are principalities and powers and, 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 and spiritual wickedness and high places and a, a battle that is raging? Right. Don't be deceived. And you, and you say, what do you do? You can pray. Amen. Say, why? Because you're trying to bring people to God. That's what you're trying. That's one reason why you're left here is to bring people to God. Paul says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. You say, what is that? Brought to God. Here's the children of Israel, the children of God who who have the oracles of God. That's the word of God and the law of God. But they were ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness and they needed to submit themselves to the righteousness of God. It's bringing people to God. So how do you do that? You can kneel. You can get low. 
You know what prayer does? Prayer will help you get low. Prayer will help you get low. Jesus Christ, as an example, he, he knelt down and he prayed. Look over John chapter 19. And look at verse number 30. It's just down, 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 down. Why? That he might bring us to God. That he might bring us to God. Say, I've been brought to God. Well, then that he might bring them to God. Hallelujah. You know anyone that needs to be brought to God? I'm telling you, you ought to come back tonight and see the video that we'll play of Brother Matt Johnson missionary in Mexico. Some of you visited him a couple of years ago, our teens and some of our workers visit. You'll, you'll, your heart will be stirred. And if it's not, we'll pray that it does. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Why? Because it's just one. And one more. And one more. And one more. Mm. The Bible says in John chapter number 19 and Verse number 30, then, Jesus Christ here is on the cross. And the Bible says in verse 30 of John 19, when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And notice, he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He came down, he stooped down, he knelt down, he bowed down his head. Say, what was he doing? Well, the Bible says in John chapter number 10 that he was laying down his life. Say, what was this? Down, down, down. Down, down. Why? To bring us to God. He laid down his life. Not long after that, a man comes in named Joseph of Amarathea. They marveled, Pilate did, that his body was already, or that he was already dead. And the Bible says about that of John chapter 19, and if you would look over there to verse number 38, and after this, Joseph of Amarathea being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. You know, they took it down from the cross and they laid it down in a tomb. You know, just this week, they feel like they've discovered the place where Jesus' body was laying. And all they're going to do is make another shrine, set up some trinkets there, and a vendor stand outside of it. And they'll make some more money on ignorant tourists who want to see that place. And by the way, I, I think it would be neat to see the actual place. I, I've never wanted to go to Israel uh, in particular, uh, but I, there's one place I would love to go. That would be what's called Gordon's Calvary. If you ever see, there's different places where they think Calvary is. A British years ago found a place called where, where he has found it, and this is where Calvary was. They call it Gordon's Calvary, and I would love to go there someday. I mean, I just walk around like this. Why? Because I just want to be where Jesus walked. I mean, just... I did that in Philippi when we were there walking. I just kind of went like this in some of those areas. And I went, this is where Paul walked. This is where Silas was. Maybe Lydia followed him around a little bit right here. Say, what did it do? Nothing. There was no pixie dust that came up and made me have the spirit of Paul or Silas or Lydia. Or won't give you Christ. You can get him through belief. Just be cool. Took his body down. They laid it in the tomb. Right? At that point, it's just his body. Why? Well, his spirit had been commended to the Father already. Into thy hands, I commend my spirit. And his soul had departed. So what happened to his soul? Well, his soul went down. I I believe as he became sin for us, he went down into hell. I say, how long? I don't know. How long would be too long? Okay, I, that's just, and that's in Ephesians. He went down to the lowest part of the earth. He went to the other side of, uh, of that area down there called Abraham's bosom, which was in the heart of the earth, in a place called paradise. It's not there any longer. Because after that, the Bible says, look, he was done being down. Yeah. Say what? He had finished his work. Amen. Your work's not finished. Right. There's still work to do. Now, that was a lot of doctrine right there in about 15 seconds. 
That's why you should come Wednesday nights. He laid down his life. He finished the work. But, but I would say this. He didn't stay down. He didn't stay down. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He ascended up to the Father. He sits there forever. Well, he sits there for now. Until he comes back to this earth to receive the saints who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Who have come to know Jesus, uh, to the Father through Jesus Christ, the Savior. And I'm just saying this. If we're going to bring people to God, you've got to go down. You've got to come down. Say, from where? I don't know. Look over to Romans chapter 12. I think we can wrap this up over in Romans chapter number 12. Most of you have heard Romans 12 before because I got saved by the preaching of the Word of God and the guy was preaching out of, Pastor Bennell, Brother Bennell was preaching out of Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable in God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Verse 3, for I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. See, so, soberly or sobriety, if you would, is the proper estimate of oneself by grace. Sobriety comes through faith. But to think soberly, according to, as God hath dealt to every man, the measure of faith. You say, what is this? That this is how we ought to think, not higher of ourselves. So what about self-esteem? Mm, I'm not trying to kill self-esteem, but what you need is spirit esteem. Yeah. What you need is savior esteem. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what do I do? Well, I, I come down. I come down. And I, I, I go low. I get low. So what is this? Humility. I mean, look, this is not this. I don't have to walk hunched. I don't have to crawl, but I come down. And there are times I have to stoop down. I understand Christ, right before he goes to the cross, he gets down and he washes the disciples' feet. He, he didn't ask them to prop them up on the barco lounger so he could do that. He had to get down. As a servant. He understood, look, the high horse is coming. A high horse is coming. See, if, if you'll humble yourself, the Bible says God will exalt you in due time. And the exaltation will come, but you know what it is for now? It's humility. Why? So that we can bring the unjust to Christ. Who can bring the unjust to to God. You see, God's not trying to you get, get them all the way there. you just got to get them to Christ. Amen. And by the way, that's not halfway. That's like, it's just a short way. Christ did the work. Yeah. He just said, you're just, you're just, we okay. you can do that. Yep. You can do that. Church, you can do that. You see, I'm visiting for the first time. You, you can do that. You can bring someone to Christ. Have you ever been there? Have you been to Christ? Like, like I've been to Christ. So you know what I can do? I can tell someone I get to Christ. But, but, so, so, look, look I, I've been to Starbucks. So what's that got to do with anything? I can tell you how to get to Starbucks. I mean, there is a well-worn path between our house and Starbucks. You ever been to Christ? Have you been to Christ? You can tell someone how to get to Christ. And all you got to do is get them to Christ because, look, look, he came down, 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 that he might bring us to God. You been to Christ? You been to Jesus? Have you come to Jesus? Different message, same invitation. Why don't you come to Jesus? You're not saved here today. You've never been to Jesus Christ. You're not brought to God. You're unjust. You can be made just through Jesus Christ who will justify you by faith. Say, I'm there. Woo-hoo, glory. 
It's the best. It's the best. So you ought to notify your face. It's the best. I mean, really. See, I'm having a tough day. I know. I have tough days too. And then I realized Jesus Christ is the best. Amen. Amen. He's the best. He's the best. And you can get some of the Jesus. You can't, but you're going to have to. You're going to have to get down. You're going to have to come down. You're going to have to go down. Oh, in due time, you'll be exalted. But in the meantime, in the meantime, you go down. Christ, our escape, our example. Let's pray. Father, thank you again.